I went for lunch with Rolex. Uh, so we've, we've got a few things that we should talk about. <laughs> Welcome to Bark and Jack, I'm Adrian. And if you're new here, this channel is just about me exploring, usually exploring watches. Today we're not exploring, we're talking about a brand. Uh, but usually I talk about watches and today we're talking about Rolex. Anyway, if you're into watches, hit subscribe down there. I don't usually sound like this. I've had the flu for the past couple of weeks and uh, I, I had to crack on. If you're into NATO straps, jump into buckandjack.shop and check out our selection of NATO straps. We ship them worldwide and they're, they're, they're going pretty hot. Anyway, what happened was I was in the kitchen having a late breakfast, feeling sorry for myself because I was, had the flu, felt like crap. Got a text message from some guys who I know at watch nerd official on instagram pause this video get your friend out give them a follow they have some awesome infographs going on and they're working on a very very cool project which i shan't share but uh, it's a worthwhile thing to follow anyway i got a text message from them saying are you free for lunch with rolex suddenly felt better got dressed ironed a shirt ran to st james i live in central london so it's quite easy for me to get there ended up being the first person at this event and what the event was it was crazy there was probably about 10 of us there. It was an event put on by an AD, Hetig and an AD down in Jersey. They put on this event, but with Rolex, and they had uh, all the Basel World pieces there, as well as uh, a, a display, a kind of whole event thing. The coolest thing was the fact that they had the head of Rolex UK there. We asked lots of questions and got answers. We spoke about wait lists, we spoke about production, we spoke about retail, we spoke about a lot of things going on there. Uh, and it was it, it was really quite interesting. I mean, I, I was the only non-buyer there. I, I haven't bought from this AD. They were very, very kind to allow me to, to attend. And I most certainly was an odd one out. The other guys in the room were big spenders with these guys. And it was so interesting hearing the conversations of guys. Not to be crude, but the, the, when you hear the spend list that these guys have and the pieces that they're buying, the pieces that they're waiting for, the pieces that they can buy like that, then these guys, they make all the cards fit into place. And it was really interesting seeing that side of it all. So first thing, these guys, massive spenders, these are the VIPs. When you go in, you're trying to put your name down on the wait list, these guys are the ones who are at the top of the wait list. And it doesn't matter where you are on the wait list, if they want something, they go to the top. Now, it doesn't mean that they get their watch straight away. They still have to wait. And it's interesting hearing how long these guys were having to wait for the pieces. Pepsis, Daytonas, Sky Dwellers, all of these pieces, these guys were still waiting for. 5711s, all of these guys were in a massive wait list for them. They're still having to wait months, sometimes years for their watches. So it's really interesting to see that end of the spectrum. Now, from the Rolex point of view, we spoke about production, we spoke about wait lists. They're fully aware of how long the wait lists are. They're fully aware of what they're able to produce. They're their idea of it and their mindset of it and I should probably be careful of how I uh, pitch this because Rolex are renowned for um, forcing people to remove content. They're aware of the wait list, they're aware of the production limitations. Are they going to do anything about it? No. They don't need to make any more watches and they don't intend on making any more watches. It isn't a matter of their choking supply, they're supplying what they want to supply. They aren't purposely making it difficult. It just is difficult. Maybe they could increase production, but to do that, they would need a bigger factory, they would need a bigger workforce. It's not something they want to do. This is luxury. Maybe they could increase production, but to do that, they would need a bigger factory, they would need a bigger workforce. It's not something they want to do. This is luxury. This isn't mess. This isn't Omega. This is the difference between Rolex and Omega. Omega churn watches out. Rolex churn more watches out. But the the the, the wanted watches. There, there are a few of them in, in Rolex, but Omega churn them out as a machine and they want everyone to have an Omega on their wrist. Rolex do what they want to do and they don't need our input. Another really interesting thing, they really don't know what's coming out. They have a little press release the day before Baselworld, but up until that point, no one knows what's happening. The head of Rolex UK he, he likes it that way. It's part of the excitement. They're all part of it. They're all fans of the company. And he, he, they just don't know. No one knows. And I kind of questioned it in my head when um, Houdinki said they had a meeting with, with Rolex just before Basel One. They said, oh, the, the guys at Rolex in America didn't know what was happening. It's like, yeah, they, of course they do. No, no they, they don't. And it, I, I like to think I can see when people are bullshitting. And uh, this guy wasn't bullshitting. I've got to be careful because he's not a spokesperson for Rolex. They didn't expect kid watch blogger here to be 
at this event so it, it, it's a bit unfair me talking about it and I probably won't be invited back again. If this video suddenly disappears and it's, it's because Relics told me off and uh, that, that stuff does happen, it, they're either going to tell me to take the video down or I'm just going to disappear. Patek have their salons um, which is owned by Patek, there's a Grand Seiko boutique in Knightsbridge which is owned by the Seiko group and there's other various independent uh, boutiques around owned by the actual companies as opposed to being an AD, we question them saying, are you going to do this? Are you going to move into retail? A very dead straight answer was Rolex is a watch maker and a watch distributor. They aren't a retailer. They aren't going to go into online retail like Omega have. They aren't going to go and open up boutiques like Patek do and, and, and so on. They trust the AD network that they've created and that's the network that they want to work down. It'd be a massive investment for them and it would be a complete change in business model for them to go out and open up a retail space. Uh, and that's not something that they want to focus on. And it was, it was quite interesting hearing it from them. It does sound weird, this information coming through me. I don't like finding out information third hand and this is this is what's happening here but I'd, I had this interaction I wanted to share the information with the pieces that I saw were superb the watches that really stood out as being interesting was that meteorite dial the the GMT the Pepsi GMT with the meteorite dial um, Jody from just one more watch <laughs> made a good comment saying that Relic should really leave the meteorite crap to um, to the, the smaller micro brands um, but I actually really like that dial there's was, there was something you know the old linen dials, um, the, the vintage linen dials, and they had a really interesting texture to them and kind of the shimmer and the light and also it's, it's just a non-uniform texture. That's what the, the meteorite dial looks like. It, it has that same air of, uh, it, it's not plain, it's not perfect, but the imperfections make it nice. That's surprisingly cool. I'd, I'd, I like that one a lot. Of course, I, I like the, the blue dial Yachtmaster, the Yachtmaster 42, far too big. Uh, great looking watch, but far, far too big. I really like the metal that, that it's in. Um, it says it's white gold, but it has a really uh, dark kind of black tone to it, which was really quite interesting. It worked well with the black strap and the um, black dial and bezel. There was something awesome about wearing this solid gold present. There's a weird sense of power that comes with wearing a solid gold watch. It does give you a feeling of, fuck everything, I can do whatever I want. Maybe that's just me. But this thing just felt brilliant. Um, although recent events have meant that it's, it's not quite as cool as what it was. The food was honestly fucking brilliant food. It was a, a three course meal and the proper decent food. And as, as a standard fanboy, I kept the menu and the name card. So there was a really interesting display at this event. You had the, the room had all the, the Basel World new releases, but there was a room dedicated to the Explorer. The whole journey of the Explorer, the fact that it started as, as an, a standard Oyster watch and then it kind of it went up Everest and it transitioned into the, the Explorer and then to what we have today. I like the fact that this event was about the Explorer. I thought that was cool. But then it made me think, why? Why are they pushing the Explorer? Are they going to discontinue, update, change? What are they going to do with the Explorer range come next Basel World? In the comments, what, what do you think they're going to be doing? They're obviously pushing the Explorer range, but why? There hasn't been a new Explorer for a while. We're due a new Explorer. Are they wanting to push the range so that they can get rid of old stock? I don't see Explorers in uh, in ADs anymore. When when I was watch shopping, I went around lots of ADs trying to find Explorer 2 to try on. I used my contacts to try and find Explorer 2 to try on. Couldn't get anything apart from resellers. But uh, So they're obviously selling, so it's... It's an interesting thing. It was a brilliant event. I absolutely loved it. Uh, the food was great. The people were great. It was awesome getting insight into that side of watch buying. Um, the guys on the top end of, of the, the lists, when watches come out, these are the guys who, who are likely to get them. And it's interesting to see when they still struggle to get them. Thanks so much for the AD putting on the event and Rolex being so cool with me just, just rocking up and, and doing my thing. Guys, let me know what you think about the whole Explorer display that they put on. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say it now. I, I think they're going to update the Explorer. Explorer range at Basel World. I know it's going to be Explorer um, or the Explorer 2. I know they've just updated the hands on the Explorer 1 or the 214270, but maybe they could go further. It'd be amazing if they launched a new 36mm. It, it's, it's a hot watch. It's by far my favourite watch. This thing is brilliant. Fucking brilliant. Anyway, guys, let me know what you guys think. If you're new here, hit subscribe down the bottom. Check me on Instagram at Bark and Jack. If you want to support the channel, jump over to BarkandJack.shop and buy some NATO straps. If you want to read some articles or some, watch some old videos, jump over to BarkandJack.com. 
And I'll see you guys next time. Take care.